Welcome to Capital Tycoon, the place where future billionaires come to get inspired. My guest today is Kuljit Bamra. He's the CEO of Keda Music Limited, a company that is known for creating the world's first electronic tabla. He has a mission to democratize Indi Indian drumming and create a better understanding of Indian music worldwide. He has also created a universal notation system for tabla. Kuljit, thank you for joining my podcast. So my first question to you, I suppose, is um, what does tabla mean to you? Well, I think it's important to say that many people don't know what a tabla is. <laughs> Um, if you, uh, some of my Indian friends, they, uh, they said it, everybody should know what a tabla is. And in India, everybody knows what a tabla is, but, uh, the moment you step outside of India, tabla is not that well known, even though many people refuse to believe that. Sure. So tabla yeah. is a drum, it's a hand drum. And what it means to me is that it is an instrument, um, an instrument that comes originally from India, but an instrument that can be used in all sorts of music as a beautiful sound. Okay. And um, what was um, your upbringing like? So like the beginnings of your journey? I was brought up in a very strict Indian family um, in England. And uh, in fact, I was born in Kenya. And um, I caught polio when I was a year old, which affected my leg. So I walk with a, a stick. And I've been in England since I was two years old. And I think uh, partly because of my disability, I think my father and my mother were very um, adamant that I should work extra hard to sort of compensate for that. <laughs> so um, I did. Um, I went to grammar school in Southall, where I live, um, and then I went to university and I studied uh, civil engineering. So I have a degree in civil engineering. Um, music was never encouraged as a full time profession. It was always kept... Um, as a hobby. And um, even though my mother was a very well known and still is a very well known community singer, music was considered something that you didn't take up as a profession. By the time I was about 15 or 16 years old in my bedroom, I had lots of tape recorders and I was creating loops of my favorite music and then playing along with them. Uh, and my father would always, you know, open the door and say, it's just a hobby. I said, yeah, it's just a hobby. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> And then uh, later on in life, when I was about 30 years old, uh, the massive turning point in my life where I began to um, readdress like what life was about and what was I supposed to be doing. And I loved the music. I couldn't believe that um, I needed to do a, like, a boring, I mean, not that it was boring, but it was like a, a job that I didn't really have a passion for. Um, and I thought I should, uh, now I have the opportunity to actually go into music full time. And the moment I handed my notice in from um, Richmond Borough Council is where I was working, actually. Uh, and uh, very shortly after that, I got a call from Andrew Lloyd Webber's company to be in a show called Bombay Dreams. Oh, wow. And then ever since then, things have escalated. So every year of my life gets busier than the previous year. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was looking forward to it tapering off at some point. But no, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And uh, that's, that's basically a background in a nutshell. Yeah. Fascinating to hear. And um, you're um, self-taught in the tabla. And so um, what do you think is the power of self-education, or I suppose the um, importance of it? That's a, that's a good question. I think, um, I mean, if I, if I can digress slightly, I, I, uh, education is very important, but I think education sort of... Um, it exercises your brain muscles. Um, I mean, if you study biology, it doesn't mean you have to become a biologist. Um, and if you study engineering, it doesn't mean you have to become an engineer. Um, I, when I was at school, I learned that atoms were sort of made up of, you know, like the molecular with the little nucleus and the electrons and protons. And I, I was taught that model. And then more recently, some people say they're like particles or waveforms. Um, so I began to question, uh, formal education. 
But I, I'm a person who is very curious, so I always want to know why. Um, why did that person say that? Why is this the way it is? Um, what's the what's the reason for this? So I'm I'm acutely curious about everything, um, and I have a knack uh, with my I suppose with my mind and my hands. Um, I'm very good practically speaking, so. Um, I can build a table out of wood. I can, you know, my whole family are carpenters, artisans, really. So I'm very good at constructing things, fixing things, putting things together. And I found out that with music, when I heard music, I could, I could, I could hear how it was put together. So yeah, I have that sort of a knack of uh, once I find out how something works, I can usually do it. Um, quite well <laughs> that sounds very arrogant but that's that's the way it is <laughs> yeah um i think yeah that's interesting you said that because um i think um on the point of education like um in school i think you're not really challenged to um like say like find the why behind things because it's like you um in formal education the system you're just um encouraged to memorize from textbooks and like content and it's not really um I think there's like a lack of creativity, I would say. Um, I mean, I, I have to say that, um, well, I mean, if, you, if, you, if I was to ask you to think of three or four millionaires or people who are successful, let's not say millionaire. I mean, I'm not a billionaire myself, even though I'm part of this show, but um, I, was, I consider myself, I think other people would consider me successful in what I do. But if I ask you to think of maybe four or five successful entrepreneurs or businessmen, um, my, I mean, my, you wouldn't say that they were educated, I don't think. <laughs> um, if you think of people who are successful, I think it's, it's um, you're, you're more likely, I might, might be wrong, but I, I'm more likely to think of people who um, are, are sort of aren't educated in the traditional way or somehow they've left it for their own pursuit of their own passion. Mm, true. And... Um... What is your practical advice on how to stand out and find your passion? I think uh, I think people's passions become very clear when they're very young. Um, so uh, if you like running or if you like cooking or if you like taking care of people or if you're someone who um, likes dancing or playing an instrument, um, I think those things are very clear at uh, a very young age. Um, and again, coming back to education, I think education can sometimes take you away from that. Um, I mean, if you watch the film Billy Elliot, that's a, a prime example of um, someone who's like brought up in a society where they're expected to become a certain, like a minor or become following their father's footsteps. But um, I think all parents can see when their children are uh, have a calling for something, and I think I think that should be promoted. Um, but uh, to answer your question, I think uh, I think everybody knows really. Uh, uh, and if you don't, then um, maybe you haven't looked deep enough. But I think everybody knows what they really want to do. And um, the the only problem then occurs is well, how do I how do I make a living out of that? And um, I always think of, um, I don't know if you know what Ikigai is, but I'm recently reading this Japanese um, Part of it, yeah. culture. Yeah, and um, uh, Ikigai, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, but they, uh, what they say, and I think it comes from Okinawa in Japan where people live a long and happy life, uh, basically because they're doing what they would love to do. So there are, uh, there's like, what do I love to do? Um, what am I good at? And how do I make money out of that? So... Those three things, um, when they're in equal balance, then they, they, will, they will support you. But I, I also believe that everybody is born with um, a talent, not only for a self-indulgence, but a talent that's useful for other people. Uh, and so it's having the courage to actually follow that. And it's difficult. I mean, it's easy to say, but it's difficult. You know, my parents were first generation immigrants in this country. So in their mind, I was going to be an engineer or a doctor. I mean, that was it. 
I was, I was, that's what I was told since the age I was, I was like six or something. You will be a doctor or you'll be an engineer. So, um, nobody asked me what I wanted to be, <laughs> but obviously the, I can understand that my parents coming into a new country, um, I mean, to pack your bags and go to another country, that's a big deal, isn't it? If you think about it. And so when you go to that country, you're really keen to integrate and settle down and, and then make money. So, um, especially in our Asian um, culture, I think it's very difficult. Um, I mean, it's a joke, but people become an accountant or a lawyer or a, a, a doctor. Um, I mean, it's, it, we're, we're laughing at it as a joke, but actually <laughs> many people still think that. Mm. Um, and so, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, but um, I, I wonder if the world is missing out on people who have an, uh, an unusual talent or something that they could really offer in a unique way. Um, so I, I think it's, uh, it's about trying to identify that for yourself and then having the courage to pursue it. I mean, uh, I don't want to get morbid, but life is very short. And um, I think it's better to live slightly risky rather than live safe, you know, otherwise, I mean, I can only really speak for myself, but I, I think there's, um, there's something in that sort of courage uh, or that, um, that way of life, which I think is probably more exciting. And I think if you're someone like that, or if, or if you're somebody who can actually bring that forward, then you'll find your, your calling. Couldn't agree more. I think it's um, very important to follow your passion. And um, I think also there's a lot of hidden potential as people are told by society, become a doctor, lawyer, engineer. So yeah, definitely. I mean, I, so, I think if I can just add yeah. something to that. Um, sure. I, um, I mean, I, I'm guilty of, um, uh, with my talent, I'm guilty of, you know, when I was younger, of, of uh, being really proud of it. And I, I'm still very proud of it. Um, but it was more about, look at me, look at what I can do. Um, I'm very good at this. I've got this special skill. I've got this special talent. Uh, aren't I good sort of thing? And it was only uh, in 2010 when I got the, my MBE from the, from the Queen um, again, not to boast about it, but it changed my life completely because when you get an honour like, which I didn't know actually, when you get an honour like that, um, and some people will know this, it says in service. All right. So it's not about you. It's about, so um, my, my citation reads, for services to Bangra and British Asian music. So that means I'm... I'm in service of that. Mm. So I never really thought of things that way. Um, and uh, when I was there at the, at the palace, um, there was another guy there who was a, a well-known chef. And um, I said, what are you here for? And he said, for services to food. <laughs> and I thought, that's just an, such a beautiful thing because, yeah, obviously you're proud of how you cook. And, but actually, ultimately food was there before you were born and you are born into the service of food. I'm born into the service of music and um, performing and creating and in inspiring people. So again, that comes back to the Ikigai thing of, you know, what am I good at? What do people want from me? You know what I mean? So it's like, I think it's, it is about service and hum human, human beings are a social creature. We, we, we benefit from each other, don't we? Yeah. So, yeah, and I think um, coming back to, um, so meeting the Queen in, um, or should I say the late Queen in 2010, um, what did you learn from um, meeting the Queen and, um, and earning your um, MBE? Well, I mean, I think I, think I probably answered that already mostly, but the, the yeah. other thing I learned actually also was, uh, and I've met the Queen like three times and, and I've spoken okay. to her. Um, so, um, interestingly that day when I, um, when I walked forward, you know, there's an etiquette, you sort of bow, then you have to say, um, you you can't speak to her unless she speaks to you. There's this, this sort of, sort of stuff. And then you say, yes, you know, your majesty, you have to address her as your majesty. Then after that, you can say, ma'am, 
So she, she said to me, I'm very pleased to give you this award. And I said, thank you very much, Your Majesty. Uh, and then she said, I really enjoyed your performance in Bombay Dreams. And I thought it sort of completely blew my mind in that moment. I thought, well, there's no way. <laughs> I mean, there were 40 actors in that show. And, um, and I didn't, that day I didn't actually shake hands with her because we were up on the podiums of musicians and she came down and met all the actors. Okay. So I, th I thought she's got it wrong. There's no way she can remember each one of them. Um, so I, 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 my mind was whizzing around and I thought she's made a mistake. She's confused it when I met her at Westminster Abbey um, and I was playing with Andy Shepherd. And that's when I did meet her. So she's got it wrong. So I said to her, uh, yes, ma'am. And uh, we also met at Westminster Abbey. And she said, yes, I know that, but I really enjoyed your performance in Bombay Dreams. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, she actually remembers it. So I, in a way, uh, again, this is a, a real acknowledgement of, uh, of, uh, of her as a, as a personality, um, whether, you're, um, whether you're up for the royal family or, or not. She did a very good job, I thought, you know, and she was in service. So when she met people, she really met them. And that's the first thing I learned is that, yeah, she's doing what she's meant to do and she does it very well. She did it very well. And again, I think the second thing I learned from the MBE was that um, it's not about me. You know, it's, uh, again, it, it's, it's about me being of service. And I, I, it was really amazing to um, uh, be acknowledged for my work. So for somebody important like that to say you're doing a good job carry on that was the most important thing I think in my life at that time and now I just when I wake up I know I've got to do that that's my that's my job yeah and th and on, on a third level um closer to home obviously it made my parents very happy so um it, it's quite um interesting with my parents because if you go to their house now, they've got pictures of me with the Queen, you know, in the living room, and it's a talking point for all the guests. And they're very, they're very proud of me, of course, as are my uncles and aunties. Um, but I, when I go over there, I do remind my dad that I got that by going in the opposite direction to what he wanted me to do. <laughs> so yeah. It's I, I, I did that myself, like despite your um, encouragement for me to be an engineer. So that the, it's quite interesting that so. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, I suppose the question arises, had I gone into music much earlier in my life or had he allowed me to go into music much earlier in my life, then perhaps I would have been even more successful, you know what I mean? So I, it made him think also that um, perhaps the way we're sort of encouraged to think by society and culture is, is um, not always the best thing for you. And unconventional paths lead to unconventional success that's that's an that's very interesting yeah that's, yeah so um coming back to now um coming back to the tabla so um yeah i know you gave a brief description of what the tabla is in um towards the beginning of the episode um could you give a more in-depth um like um overview of the tabla for those who don't know at all yeah, sure. And a lot of my Indian colleagues will hate me for saying this, but I describe tabla as a bongo drum. Um, now, it's not a bongo drum, but it's if you're going to find an instrument and you're going to explain to somebody who doesn't know what a tabla is, if you say bongo, they will know exactly what sort of thing it is. Um, so it is a two-piece drum, one slightly larger than the other one. It makes a lower sound and the other one makes a, a more... Uh, higher pitch sound uh, and this distinguishing feature of the tabla uh, is that they have black spots in the middle of them of the drums and because of the black spots the tablas resonate and uh, I mean if you think of a bongo it goes tick tock tick tock tick tock you know um, whereas a tabla goes ding so it, you actually can hear a note because the black pastes in the middle of the drum heads, they allow the, the drum skin to resonate for longer so you can hear a pitch. Um, and uh, so the tabla is uh, basically a, a, a hand drum. You don't play it with sticks. And, um, and it's got a very beautiful tone to it, um, a low sa sound and a higher sound, which is tuned to a, a particular pitch. The low drum can also be manipulated by with your the heel of your hand 
to create um, a slide or a glissando is the proper musical term for it. So you could go like that. And so when you hear that sound, you know it's a doubler. And in fact, um, many people who don't know what a doubler is, which I think is the majority of the, of the world, uh, when I play it for them, they, oh yes, I've heard that drum. And they have heard it in film soundtracks and in, and in pop music. Um, but people haven't put the two and two together and said, oh, that's a doubler. Whereas a guitar, if you heard a guitar or a piano, you just know what that is because they're so common, um, yeah. you know, in, a, in our, in our um, vision. And I think um, you played the tabla for Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the soundtrack, um, if I'm correct. That's correct. Yeah. So I've played tabla in, and, and Indian percussion in many films like The Guru, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. In fact, the, um, the, the Gust is it Gustus Gloop, I've forgotten the name of the character in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, mm. that, um, that Oompa Loompa song is to a Bangra rhythm, which I obviously I've done a lot of Bangra music. Um, yeah. So if you hear that song again, uh, you will realise it's ding 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 because it's got a Bangra groove to it. One one thing to say about Dubla um, is that um, I think I I consider myself very lucky to have been brought up in England um, because I I've, I've been um, I've had to question certain things. Uh, for example, people say to me, "Why is the black spot on the big drum?" not in the middle. Now, I've asked tens and tens of people in India, and in fact, people who are watching this who are tabla players, they'll have an answer for it, but it's, it's sort of, I would say it's not the correct answer. <laughs> so they would say, oh, this is the way we've always done it. That's the most common answer. That's the way it should be. Um, some people say the sound's better there. Now, as an engineer, I would say that the sound is be would be better if the circular spot was in the middle. So I actually made, I had doublers made for me. My, in fact, my doublers all have the spots in the middle of the drum because that's the, that's the place where you get a, a, a purer tone. I mean, I, I have an answer for that question. I'm, I don't need to tell you what it is if you, unless you're interested, but I have an answer. And, and I think people have, um, the doubler somehow has become, um, so entwined with the Indian tradition, so much so that it is no longer serving itself as, a, as an instrument. So what, what I mean by that is, um, let's, let's first look at, if you think of a tabla player, most likely you're thinking of a brown person, not a white person. Now, some people will say, no, I, I know, I know, uh, uh, there's, an, there's a white man who plays tabla. It's like, but that's, well, that's very good, but that's one person. I mean, I can probably name five or six at a push. So that's one indication to me that something is not right in the way that we're promoting the use of tabla because music should be for everybody, in my opinion. And um, when you go to a shop to buy a guitar, uh, the, the shopkeeper doesn't say to you, you have to f play flamenco on it and nothing else. I mean, that's absurd, isn't it? So yeah. when you buy a piano and it says, no, this is a Beethoven piano, you can't play anything else on it. <laughs> I mean, that's absurd. Uh, and people will laugh at that. But when you buy a tabla, it's almost got an invisible sign on it saying you're going to play Indian music on this. So even now, my dad, uh, I, I joke with my father. So when I come back from a concert, in fact, I came back from um, uh, Amsterdam last week to do a concert. He said, how was the concert? I said, the concert was very good. And he said, what, um, what tala did you play? Now, tala is the word for an Indian rhythm. So he said, uh, what, what tals did you play? And I said, well, I didn't play any. He said, well, you must have played something. <laughs> I said, no, I didn't. He said, well, what did you play then? I said, I, just, I played sounds. He said, well, you must have played Din Dal or Jap Dal. I said, no, I didn't play any of that at all. Now, he's, he's, in his mind, if you play Dabla, then you have to play an Indian rhythm. There's no way you can play something else. And um, so all the, uh, and this is, a, this is a, you can call it a complaint if you want, or maybe you can call it as an observation, but all um, Indian teachers of tabla and of uh, and other Indian instruments such as sitar, 
they will teach you how to play ragas and dalas on those instruments. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. You, it's, it's very good to practice your art with, those, with that knowledge. But it doesn't mean you have to play that when you become a fully-fledged musician. So, uh, and also, if I ask you to name tabla players, I bet you people couldn't name more than two or three. Mm. So, um, whereas if you think of guitar players or piano players <laughs> or singers in the, in, in the Western genre or in, in any genre, you can think of like tens and tens of people. So, somehow... Um, tabla has become an instrument that has to be played in an Indian way. So I did that for most of my life and I loved it, um, but it became too limiting for me and the music sort of became the same. I know if I'm going to play a classical concert with a sitar player or a singer, they're going to start off with a slow unfolding of the, the notes like an alarp. I'm going to come in with a thala. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a conversation and then we'll end with you know and it's like oh god that is okay it's beautiful but for me it is boring <laughs> uh, and no no offense to anybody um who's who who loves that but as a player um for me i don't think tabla has become a worldwide instrument it's an instrument that if you know it you will be in awe of it but it's not an instrument um if you go to see a tabla player on stage at a concert most likely you will walk away from the concert saying, oh my God, he was amazing. Wow, he was incredible. And in fact, double players, the ones that we know, generally are incredible and amazing. I don't think you would say, I really want to learn to play that. <laughs> I think that concert would have probably made you even further away from the doubler than when you started because you think there's no way I could play like, like that person and therefore I'm going to not bother. And so a lot of the people that I meet, especially orchestral percussionists who are learning in Western conservatoires, they thought they've seen the tabla, they love it, but there's no one who can teach them in a way in which they can bring it into their world. And uh, there's no one who can teach them or can play in a way that an audience member will say, I love that instrument, I'm going to learn to play it. Whereas I think if you, if you see someone play the piano or guitar or sing a song in a pub or in a concert, um, you'd go, oh, God, I, I can do that. I'm going to do that. But with Dabla, you're going to say, he's great, which means I'm not great. Right, <laughs> and yeah. so, even that, so it's become wowing. And um, it's, it's a bit like a circus act. So you go to watch a circus stunt and you think, wow, that was amazing. There's no way I could do that. And so I think a lot of tabla players and musicians have begun to wow audiences rather than perhaps um, open the doors a bit more. Interesting. So that, was a, that was a long answer, but uh, yeah. I know, absolutely. And um, now um, you invented the world's first electronic tabla as well as the um, tabla notation system. Um, how did you come up with the idea? It, uh, the idea was born out of a problem, actually. So, um, first of all, you know, doublers are quite heavy. They're about, uh, they're probably about 10 kilograms. Once you've got it, you know, all the accessories and they rest on cushions that are quite heavy, then you've got a hammer. So if, you're, if your doublers are like three kilograms each, that's six, six kilograms plus plus the cushions, the resting cushions, plus a hammer, plus your case, if it's a hard case, it's going to end up being 13 kilograms. So, I mean, that's not a big problem, and uh, that's just the way it is. But it did, because I was gigging so much, it just occurred to me, my God, these, <laughs> these are cumbersome things to carry around. But the, the turning point um, for me was when I was in Bombay Dreams, um, in a theatre show in the West End. I mentioned it earlier. Um, now I, I have to I have to say something first, just for listeners who don't know about this. But if you watch an Indian classical concert, um, like a sitar recital or a, a bamboo flute recital or a, a sarod or you know um, vocal recital or an Indian violin, 
that whole concert will be in one key. So if it's in C, the whole of that raga recital will be in the key of C. The tabla player will tune uh, their tabla to the C note uh, because the the key of the raga is is in C. So um, there's no um, modulation, uh, as we would call it in the Western world. There's no modulation or um, transposing that happens later on. Um, so that whole concert takes place in one key. Now, because I played with a lot of Western musicians, and in particular Andy Shepard, um, the jazz saxophonist, uh, and also when I was in Bombay Dreams, um, each song was in a different key. So one song was in C. The next song, which happened immediately without a break, might be in F then the next one's in A, then I go back to the C again, then there might be something in G. And I thought, this is, I mean, this is an absolute nightmare for me because I need, I need to have all the notes of the doublers. So what I did was I took like seven or eight doublers with me of the right keys. They were tuned before the show to, the, to those keys. And I would then, while I was playing one song, I'd be think it's, it would say in my chart, I'd write it in there, get ready for the next song. So I'd be playing and I'd have to put the doubler down on the floor and pick up the other one ugh, and put it there and be ready in time for that, um, for that song. Now, as you know yourself as a doubler player, the, when you tune your doubler, because it's made of skin, goat skin, yeah. and the straps are made of uh, hide as well, any change in temperature or humidity will affect it. So by the time I picked up my new double for the next song, it had gone out of tune. And also on stage, you've got lights. So the yeah. lights come on, the lights go off. The temperature changes, the doubler note changes. You've got smoke machines. Smoke machine comes on, goes off. Everything affects the, the doubler. So I really thought at that point, oh my God, you know, because I was in the show for two years doing eight shows a week. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I, love, I, lo I loved it. Wow. Um, because I was on stage and I could also see the audience. But anyway, that's, that's another, uh, that's another um, by the way. I then thought, wouldn't it be great if I just... Oh, well, I, I, what I thought in my imagination was, could I have a doubler that changed its, its pitch automatically and stayed in that pitch? And now I need, I need a dial that I can turn, A, E, F, G, A, B, you know. So like, and that was my sort of uh, fantasy. And it was... Uh, it was like 10 years, oh yeah, about 10 years later, actually, yeah, maybe less than that, that I met um, one of my friends who plays viola, Claire Finnimore. She plays in the Britain Symphony Orchestra. And uh, I mentioned to her, um, you know, the issues of playing tabla on stage and the tuning and what sort of, and she said, you should meet my um, husband, Graham England. He's a product designer. And so I met Graham and Graham said he could make an electronic tabla for me. So I, we, we did our first prototype um, and it was mind blowing. And so going forward to like tw the end of 2019, we'd, uh, we'd made our third prototype by then. And I was so impressed with it um, that I made a video, um, a short video of me showing it to my fellow co-workers uh, in, the, in the office. Um, and that, that we put that I put that video up on YouTube and it went viral. You know, it's probably on six million views now. But it's uh, wow. and then uh, people wanted to buy it. So then we, we weren't really fully ready. You know, because I mean, the demand is so big we can't handle the demand uh, with the current um, model. So we're now um, doing one which can be mass produced. But we're selling. We've been selling them now for a couple of years, and um, and I do concerts with them myself you know so I, I i love it and also it's affected the way that i have, am creating music with it so i'm because you can change pitch i can change pitch within a song you know like i could do stuff you can't do that with a doubler yeah. i'm still a doubler player and i'm still using doubler technique because you have to play it like a doubler player um but i have an access to um a whole new sort of creativity. Um, plus it has um, something called MIDI, which means you can connect it to a computer or um, a sound, another sound module.
and okay. I can I can trigger those sounds with my tabla technique. So it's it's incredible, you know. I mean, I didn't know the actual um, the potential scope of how how it could affect music as such. <laughs> started off as a, as a problem that I wanted to fix and mainly the problem of tuning so that's how the that's how the idea came for me and then, then it um, just like when I have a, a, a song in my mind and I record it I had this idea in my mind and I I made it happen so I, that's another one of my strengths I suppose or one of my skills is that if I have a thought um, or an idea I will do that you know, I and that's people can count on me for that. I think if you speak to my friends, they will say, "Yeah, he's that sort of a guy." <laughs> so, yeah, incredible. Yeah, and also, um, idea to implementation. I su uh, implementation. I suppose that's the key to um, making things happen. Uh, to yeah, I mean, that's it's very easy to say idea to implementation because, in fact, even when I did electronic doubler, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the first person who had that idea. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I can guarantee it. You know, there are very few new ideas, uh, and if you go to a pub next door, everybody's got ideas about how they can fix the world. I mean, without sounding rude, um, but I'm the sort of guy that if I have an idea, uh, in a weird way, believes that if an idea comes to me, like if a thought comes to me, then I need to fulfil it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's quite an absurd. Um, thing uh, but I well I mean I, I compose like that and I um, create things like that so I have ideas for projects so if an idea comes to me then I think that I'm I should do it that's my um, my duty so to speak or um, yeah so then I you know I'm that sort of a guy that does take something um, what's the phrase you use from idea to implementation yeah yeah why Kedah Kedah is the name of our company, and um, Kedah is uh, actually Kedah is a, a name of um, my record label that I've had for um, uh, quite a few years. It was set up by um, four of us: uh, Kuljit, Sam, David, and Alan. So it was like a, a boring way of coming up with a company name, uh, Kedah. But uh, we decided to keep the name. Uh, my new co-founders in Kedah Music, which is a different company. Our Graham, who is the guy that built the first prototype, um, and um, Philip Edishaw. And so we uh, we decided to keep the name. Ker Da are also two sounds on the on the tabla. So Ker uh, Da. Okay, that's interesting. And what have been your hardest moments in business? That's a good question. You know, you know, business, you can't do business on your own. I mean, uh, that's obviously, a, that, that's an obvious statement, I suppose. Some people might think, I'm going to become a business person and I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to get people to do that, I need to get people to do this and people have got to do this for me to, so I can become. And actually business is, again, it's a service, isn't it? <laughs> so yeah. we, come back to, we come back to this same old chestnut, you know, of uh, it's, and so uh, and what I'm getting at is you have to work with people. Now, if you're someone that isn't good with people, most likely you're not going to become a good businessman. <laughs> mm. I know that's, uh, that's going to puncture people's balloons. But um, so uh, to answer your question, sometimes you do come across people who are difficult to work with. And, uh, and I... I you know, I'm an, I'm extremely sensitive, um, as opposed as a person. So I, if if I get upset or if I'm if I'm down or if somebody says something that hurts me, I mean, for me to pretend that that doesn't happen to me would be ridiculous. So it does happen. We're all human, aren't we? So these are the sort of things that happen. Some some people are uh, have a have ulterior motives or they have another agenda. 
And um, sometimes you don't find that out until you're halfway <laughs> through the project. <laughs> so then you. Uh, uh, so I'm I'm not one for abandoning abandoning a project. I, I would like to see it through, but I think the hardest parts in business are not. Uh, you, you don't want to spend too much time licking your wounds. You know, you, you have to get up and go. See, I don't have a boss now. I did have a boss when I was an engineer, so I know what it's like to have a nine to five job. And when you've got a nine to five job, you have to get out of bed because if you're going to be late, you're going to be penalized somehow. Either you're going to get told off by your boss or you're going to, he's going to dock your pay. Or she sure. is. So when you have a nine to five job, you have to get out of bed. When you're working for yourself, you need to find you need to find something that's going to get it. Get, I mean, you see, I love my bed, <laughs> as many people do. It's a nice, warm, cozy place, right? So, why would I want to get out of bed? So, you have to create something that's sort of bigger than yourself. Um, otherwise, you're not going to get out of bed. You know, I mean, I, a, I was just distracted by a thought there when I during lockdown. Um, I know it's a very, very difficult period and. Many people had a very, very bad time. I, I mean, I lost three of my friends actually during during um, the COVID pandemic. But oh, aside aside from that, um, I I I have this recording studio, right? So I'm I have my own rec I live here. I live upstairs. So my recording studio downstairs, and I. It was a bit like many people. It was a bit like being imprisoned because we were not allowed to go out and. Luckily, I wasn't in a one-bedroom flat. I have a, a large recording studio. So I every day I got out of bed at 7 o'clock and I vowed to compose a song every day. And, um, and then so in lockdown, I, I composed 132 songs. <laughs> wow. Uh, and I've recorded like 43 of them now. So, uh, I mean, I'm not showing off. I'm just saying... I could very easily stay in bed and um, just let time pass. Um, I could have done that. I really, I really could have done. And when I'm on holiday, I do that quite a bit. So it's not like I'm a robot or anything like that. Uh, some of my friends might disagree, but uh, so I created, I created a way of a reason to get out of bed. So I got out of bed. I spent all day in the studio and I watched a film every evening as a sort of reward for myself. Now. I did that for me. I didn't have any, a boss telling me what to do. Now, some people can't do that. I would, I would question whether, you, whether they can't do it. Um, I, I think maybe they won't do it. You know what I mean? So it requires a bit of soul searching to be able to, 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 um, to find those things. I think also I'm a bit older than you're obviously a lot older than yourself. So I'm very aware that life is short. It's very short. So I've got stuff that I need to do. And that's why I love what I do. And it's not like a stress or a panic, but it's really I have things that I definitely want to do before I, I you know, I leave this place. Um, when you're young, you probably don't think like that because you think you've got, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, but I think the thing is the time, time is very short. And so what I'm getting at is um, you have to create your own reason for doing what you want. And, you know, coming back again to what's unique, you know, what's unique about you, find out what's unique about you and then work with that. Cause that and then when you go on that path, the path gets created itself. So you, you have to take the first step and, it, and you will make a path for yourself. But coming back to your question, I think the hardest times are... Well, number one, you might meet a group of people or some people who are probably not thinking the way that you do. Um, number two, there might be times when you just think, you know what, I don't, I don't feel like doing anything. Um, and I'm just going to spend all day in bed or I'm going to watch TV and eat chocolate, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. So um, those are the hardest bits. And uh, one last thing from me is... Um, now, to answer that question, I think is how do you 
obviously business is about making money. Now, even even when I say that, it doesn't sound right because it's not about it's not necessarily about making money. You have you have to be producing something that that is of use to other people. You can't just make money. Well, unless somebody knows something that I, I don't, that I don't, you need other people there, and you need to have a, a service that that appeals to other people in order to make money. Sometimes money comes and goes. So um, one of the one of the uh, things that I battled with a lot was self worth. Like, what am I worth? So, if somebody says they wanted they wanted me for two hours to either compose or give some advice or play tabla or produce something, I would have to put a value on that. Now, there is there really isn't a value on that. <laughs> there, there's no monetary value on that. So you have to, either you'll go and find what other people charge, but then you might think you're not as good as those people or you might think you're better than those people. So I, I think that when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, it sort of flows. I know it's sort of the tide is high sometimes and the tide is low sometimes, but it sort of flows. Um, I, I sort of trust that. Um, but then sometimes that is also a challenge to sort of trust as well. So those are the, those are the key sort of things uh, that I would say are the difficult times. Yeah. And obviously you mentioned purpose, people fo following like um, their why. Um, what, what's your... Um, opinion on purpose you see um you could very easily argue that life has no purpose you just live and then you die <laughs> hmm. um you uh if you if you want to make some meaning out of your life and me personally i i'm very aware that my my life is i mean i'm like we're, we're like ants aren't we if you if you if you zoom out from planet Earth, we're so small. We're like little bacteria. I mean, yeah. When you fly in an aeroplane, you look out the window, you can't see any human beings, can you? Mm. you know? And then suddenly you get a bit closer and you think, oh, my God, there's houses. And then in each house there's a family. Oh, my God. We're so um, small. Yet I think it's important to have um, – to create a sort of, I mean, there may not be a meaning to life. I know it's a very, it's a very big question you're asking, but um, I think it's useful, um, if not necessary, to actually create some sort of a meaning. So, as an example, um, the meaning that I've created for my life is, I mean, I, you know, people people always tell you what you're good at, don't they? So yeah. uh, I've seen this quite a lot where people say, wow, you're really good at that. And then the person says, no, I'm not really. <laughs> so, I mean, I meet singers all the time. God, you're a really good singer. No, no, I'm not really good. I'm not really good. And uh, I said, well, you're really good at doing that, aren't you? Oh, no, no, I'm not really good. No, no, I'm really good. And it's really funny because um, I was the same. People tell you what you're good at and then you think, no, 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 I'm not as good as I should be. And all. But then uh, for me personally, when uh, there was a turning point when I thought, oh, my God, they're actually – Lots of people are saying the same thing, so maybe it's true. <laughs> and so uh, it just took. I was so stubborn, you know, to to follow that idea. Um, and uh, then, then I think you, if you have, if you're someone who can take that on, then you can create a, um, a purpose. You know what I mean? If you're someone who thinks like, okay, I'm not a nine to five guy, I'm. Um, I've, I'm self. I'm self motivated. I'm an independent person. Um, I can uh, take care of things around me, um, and this is what I've got to offer. Then, in a way, that's that's what you do, isn't it? So, if that's what you do, then that's what. You, then you could say that's what your purpose is. Yeah. So, um, and you don't have to be an entrepreneur to have a purpose you can be a nine to five person to have a purpose a very an equally valid purpose as well so it doesn't mean you have to be an entrepreneur or make lots of money everybody can create a purpose for themselves um i don't know if you know the story about the guy who's um I'll, I'll cut it short but there's a guy watching another guy this guy's sweeping the road and this guy says to him what are you doing he says, i'm i'm um, i'm sweeping the road 
And he says, oh, I can see that. And he said, but what, what, are you, what are you doing with that? And he said, what do you mean? He said, I don't know, I'm just sweeping the road. And then the guy thought, and the sweeper thought, and he said, well, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm creating a cleaner road. <laughs> mm. This other guy said, oh, well, that's amazing. And what are, you, what are you making with that? And he said, well, I'm making a cleaner country. <laughs> Wow, incredible, yeah. Oh my God, I'm actually, cl I'm, I'm, my purpose is like to keep the planet clean. You know what I mean? Mm. I know I've, I've um, shortened the story, but I, I think uh, it's useful to um, create a purpose. I mean, I, I would say that if I have a purpose, which I think I do, it's to inspire people. It's to um, uh, allow, you know, in, in, with regards to tabla and music is to, as you said earlier on, democratize Dubla playing because I want I want more people to love Dubla and more people to play it. But at the moment, I think our uh, the way we're teaching Dubla actually pushes people away rather than brings them closer. I want Dubla should be in all schools. It's not djembe's are in, in in every single school's got African drums, djembe's and guitars and pianos. Why aren't there Dublas there? So we're not doing something right as teachers. And I think it's my purpose to actually. Um, uh, lead to that sort of mission. Mm. What is your number one advice? My number one advice to to who? <laughs> um, I'd say particularly to young people because they're the main um, audience watching. Oh, sure, sure. Um, the number one advice I would give to somebody is follow your passion and be, be aware that perhaps what you're supposed to do or what people tell you you should do or what you're what you're supposed to do maybe is is inaccurate mm. and and if you've got a passion for something give that a go uh, as i said earlier on life is very short and you uh, i know young people um when they hear that they think oh god what a boring old whatever but honestly anything can happen tomorrow anything can happen tomorrow so um again i don't want to get morbid but life is very short so do follow your passion that's a good advice and um now creativity you're a creative um i suppose you're in the creative field um do you think there's like a lack of creativity in society um, or, and how do we encourage that um, otherwise? I don't think there's a lack of creativity because you could be uh, a cook or you could be an accountant or you could be certainly an accountant uh, or you could be, um, uh, I don't know, a bus driver and you could still be creative, right? So um, I think there's a lack of respect for creative arts. So people still think that playing music, uh, in my opinion, from what I can see, people still think that's sort of a low, uh, a low level uh, necessity in society. Um, although, doesn't everybody listen to music? I mean, so then where's the music going to come from? You know what I mean? So uh, the other thing also is the people talk about music being healing and stuff like that. Well, of course, I mean, if you put on a song and it makes you feel good, it has healed you, <laughs> has it not? So, yeah. of course, so these, and I'm talking about music, but I'm also talking about art. Um, and there is a, the value put on the creative industries is low. People still focus on um, the sort of uh, empirical sciences more than necessary, I think. So academia, um, and these sort of things, um, again, not to knock them, but people certainly wouldn't put um, music, I think, on par with those professions. Um, I remember when I was playing tabla as a youngster and uh, one of my uncles, I think I must have been 20 years old or something, one of my uncles came up to my father to have a dig at him and said, um, your son plays very good tabla and my dad said, thank you. And he said to him, does he do anything else? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that wound my dad up, of course. But uh, what what my uncle was saying was that um, this is just non. This is just like a hobby or, or mm. sort of a, a pastime. It's not a 
yet, you know, music is so powerful. Music has been proven to help with mental health. I mean, you just need to look back at COVID when people were playing music. How many people watch the film or listen to music while they're at home? The, you know, a mathematical formula couldn't do that, could it? You wouldn't say, oh, I'm going to do some mathematics. That's going to make, really make me feel good. <laughs> some yeah. people might do. So um, to answer your question, I think there isn't a lack of creativity, but I think the arts are um, creative arts and creative professions are still looked down, you know, in a snooty way. Okay. And what are you working on next? What I'm working on next is getting the tabla, electronic tabla out into India because obviously it's an Indian drum and India has many, many tabla players. Uh, at the moment, our prototype is um, too expensive for the average well, for the average person, actually, let alone the average tabla player. Um, so I want to make that more affordable, which we're doing. And so we will, in the next couple of months, we will launch in India. That's uh, the main thing. The other thing also is I want uh, the notation system that I've developed to be used more um more widely so that people can actually write down their repertoire at the moment indian music learning exists in people's memories so it's not written down anywhere which is absurd um, right. i mean it makes those people feel really good <laughs> but it's of no use to anyone else you know why can't you write it down so uh, I, I know many uh, i can hear many of my indian colleagues saying uh, and some people really think indian music you can't write it down now you can't write down any music, believe it or not. <laughs> when you write down music, that's not the music, is it? If I hold up this... Uh... Yeah, so here's, here's, a, here's some music, right? People recognise this. Yeah. Yeah? So you get yes. that. So if I ask anybody, what's that? They say, that's music. That's not music. <laughs> that's a bit of paper. True, yeah. Yeah. The music happens when a, when a musician plays this. Mm. Th this is not the music, but this is a very helpful tool to get people to understand it. And if you've got lots of musicians, they can, they can be on the same page when they're playing. Indian musicians generally don't work in large groups. They're usually soloistic by nature. Or you might have a band that's four or five people, in which case you can communicate by looking at each other. If you've got 100 people playing music, you'll need something like this. But this is not the music. This is a way of writing. You know, when you go to a, a, a restaurant, you, the menu is not the food. You don't, you don't eat the menu, do you? No. <laughs> okay, I've made my point. So, uh, so um, I, I'm really interested in getting uh, all the repertoire that's been archived in people's memories. I'd like to get that out onto paper so that everybody can understand it. Uh, you know, the beautiful thing about this is many, many people on the planet can look at that and understand that and they can right. see how it works. So that's the beauty. We don't have that in India at the moment. There's no reason. Okay. Um, so there, there are certain notations with Dabla, but um, they, they're not universal. It, it, you know, people write down the sounds, but there's no tempo marking. There's no way of writing rests. Um, and... Uh, there's no way of writing dynamics and stuff like that. So we're, it's still very, very early stages. Um, people still don't believe me when I, when I say there's no written music in India for classical music. People still refuse to believe that, <laughs> but it's true. Yeah. So that's, the, that's my next thing. And these, these are 43 songs that I recorded during lockdown. I'm now mixing those at the moment. So they're, they're, okay. it's a, it'll be a Bollywood album. Yeah. So those right. are the three main things I'm working on. And... My last question to you is, who inspires you? I don't have one particular person that inspires me. I, I am, this is going to sound really um, crazy to some people, I am so glad to be alive. <laughs> now, I, I know that sounds, uh, you know, it sounds weird from when I say it, but like, if you, I mean, let's talk about you for a minute. If you, if you imagine... The chances of your mother meeting your father and then you being born. So let's go back a bit further. The chances of your grandparents meeting and then having your parents and then your parents meeting and then having you, the chances of that happening are like ridiculous. And suddenly you're, you're alive on this planet. So 
I I'm inspired by just um by life itself, you know, and just uh I, I'm amazed by life. It's an incredible to be alive. I know there are bad times in life and there are good times in life. These things go hand in hand, right? You can't have one without the other. So that's the that's the way it is, right? But I'd much rather have that than not be alive. And and again, I've created a purpose for myself where I, I'm going to do that. There is, you know what? For people listening to this show, you're the only person on this planet that is like you. Now, there are there are other people who like the same films as you, and like the same music as you, and they might like the same clothes as you, but there is no one on this planet like you. You are the only person on this planet like you. And so that's incredible, isn't it? I mean, yeah. that's just that's just mind blowing. <laughs> and so, um, so then, 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 who are you then? You know, I want to know who you are. Like, what's what you, what what are you, what are you going to do? You know, yeah. So I, I, of course, there are people that I, um, uh, there are people that I listen to or I hear talk. I don't think I have one person that inspires me. I, I'm constantly curious and looking for things that are useful um, to my way of thinking and to my processes and my projects. Um, and I'm just so, I'm so glad I've got like these things in my hands and my eyes and my brain. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I know it's a very weird answer and probably not the one you're looking for, but um, it, life is very precious and short and just if you're gonna if you're gonna be you, be yourself a hundred percent. That's what I would say. <laughs> Good answer. And where can people find you on um, social media? Uh, I'm very easy to find on social media. A lot of um, social media experts tell me how lucky I lucky I am to have my name because if I was called John Smith, um, it'd be a bit harder. But called Jim Bamra. If you Google my name, you will find me. I'm very easy to find. I think I'm the only Kuljit Bamra probably who does what I do. So yeah, and uh, yeah, I have a YouTube channel called Demystifying Indian Music and uh, I have a website for my company Kedi Music Limited, but I'm very easy to find on social media. Yeah, so and if if you if anybody wants to get hold of me they they can uh, feel free to contact me, drop me an email or drop me a message, no problem at all, and I'll do my best to get back to them. Okay, and um, you wrote a book, I believe, um, uh, on the. I think I have that actually. Um, the tabla notation uh, book. Or what's the name of the book? Then I can put it up on the screen for the. Yeah, thank uh, you very audience. much. Yeah, it's called Read and Play Tabla, okay. and so uh, usually um, Indian musicians play without reading. If you think of a Western musician, most of the times they they have score in front of them and they're playing a you know a written a written score. Um, so it's called Read and Play Tabla, uh, and in there you can look at the notation. And also with that book, you can there are exercises for tabla. You can go onto the website and play along with a backing track, and the exercises are in the book. And you can learn tabla on your own at home. Okay. And in closing, um, we actually have a closing tradition in this podcast. The previous guest writes a question for the next guest but they don't know who they're writing it for. So my previous guest, what they wrote is, um, what would you do if you weren't afraid at all? What would I do if I weren't afraid at all? Um, I think I would bungee jump. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's one thing that does, I mean, I'd, I'd love to do it. Yeah, I'm yeah. scared of it, yeah. Um, I always think the rubber band is not going to be, it's going to be too long or something. I'm going to hit the ground and go splat. So I think uh, the, my immediate answer is I would bungee jump. <laughs> Good one. Yeah. And also, um, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. So um, it was a fascinating dis discussion, Kuljit, and I learned a lot from you. And I'm sure the audience has also found a lot of value in this conversation. Kuljit, thank you for joining today um, in this episode. And it was a great pleasure having you on. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you.